Hello and welcome everyone. This is Visegrad Inside organized uh, debate, debate between members of the European Parliament. Uh, part of a project we run at Visegrad Insights together with the European Parliament, um, uh, hinting on, on, on the important issues uh, related to democratic security, uh, part of our cooperation uh, also with the National Endowment for Democracy. This debate is um, on, the, on the question of uh, EU-US uh, strategic relations at, um, at, uh, at the brink of 100 days of Joseph Biden uh, administration. Uh, around that time, usually uh, pundits and analysts uh, focus on the accomplishments and the state of, um, state of uh, policy development uh, from, from the administration point of view. We're looking into, into the state of, of the European-US transatlantic relations. And we're hosting today a group of uh, fantastic speakers uh, uh, that are uh, Radosław Sikorski, uh, former Minister of Defense, uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs and former Speaker of, uh, of the Parliament of Poland, uh, today uh, presiding the delegation, the European Parliament delegation um, to, to US um, and other two members of the same delegation, also coming from Central Europe, uh, Katalin Cech, Katalin Czech uh, from, from Hungary, Momentum uh, Party, a member of Renew uh, political uh, group, and Vladimir Ilčić, um, uh, Spolu Party from Slovakia, member of the European People's Party, just like uh, Mr. Mr. Sikorski. And there is a lot to talk about. Um, uh, we are hosting, and uh, you, you will see questions uh, in the debate from uh, a group of uh, diplomats, experts, journalists, but also subscribers, people who subscribe to Visegrad Insight are entitled uh, to, to participate. They are invited to, to our special events like this one recorded uh, just yesterday. And, uh, and uh, throughout the discussion, we will be first allowing our guest speakers to, um, to explain their positions or uh, about, uh, make a you know, picture, picture the, the, the state of these relations and the challenges ahead of us. And then we will go in the second half of the, the meeting into Q&A that, uh, as you will see, is very lively, very, lots of interesting questions, and one hour is not enough. Uh, uh, let me just add at the very beginning also that uh, there are three areas that we wanted to focus, um, and indeed we, we did manage. Uh, the, the, the first area is the area of, you would say, strategy uh, of, of EU and US relations. We, um, we're looking at, when, when we talk about strategy, we, we talk about strategic challenges usually or risks that the strategies are about to mitigate, uh, at least in politics. Uh, we're not talking about business strategies here. And uh, in, that, in that terms, EU and US for a number of years already have been trying to define who are the, or trying to, to name who in fact the, the, the rivals are of the global scene. Uh, Russia and China came into picture. I mean, Russia has been there for quite some time. China has been rising as a strategic rival, both in the documents, in the narratives, in the political discussion um, across the Atlantic. And we're gonna refer to that. Um, link to that are, of course, other security questions or dilemmas. Uh, we, are, we were speaking exactly on the day when the tensions um, on the Ukrainian border, Russia-Ukraine border, were, uh, were uh, very high. Um, and just a, a couple of hours before the, uh, the discussion started, uh, there was an announcement from Russia that they are withdrawing uh, their troops uh, from the border to de-escalate the tension. Uh, there are also questions of Iran and many other uh, challenges of, of present day. There are global challenges where Europe and US um, need, well, try to address it uh, strategically. Then the second area that uh, we wanted to touch and, and some of the discussions uh, go that way is on the economy, trade, uh, and, uh, and the future of green and also technology. Um, uh, the, the members of the European Parliament that sit in different committees and they uh, they also relate to that, but, um, but they are also very important issues. And on the date of the debate, it was the day when uh, Joseph Biden opened um, the, the global the virtual climate summit uh, with participation of some Central European leaders and uh, very, very bold promises uh, on, on, on cutting uh, emissions. Uh, 
Uh, we also uh, touched on, on trade and tax and also as tax pa packages are announced, they meet uh, ambitions that are voiced across the EU also on taxing uh, big players, big, uh, uh, big players in the business that otherwise were um, somehow were able to avoid taxation in the post-COVID recovery. That, that is one of the essential uh, points of, of what, uh, what the political discussion is about how to generate revenue for the for the recovery effort and finally and not i mean this is uh, last but not least this is a very important point especially from the point of view of our efforts and project this is about uh, the discussion on uh, central europe and democratic security of central europe in other words um, you know is biden administration uh, doing the right thing uh, so far uh, is um, our rumors about him maybe visiting Slovakia instead of other V4 countries, uh, which are bigger um, but less democratic, um, according to all, all indices we, we have been reading and showing recently. Uh, is it, would that be a right move? Um, how how, how uh, US and, and, and generally European US relations are important to Central Europe? So, um, uh, here's the debate. Uh, welcome and um, uh, allow me now to, um, to start uh, to, to play the recording. I'm of the view that when politicians don't act uh, actively do harm, it's already alleluia and uh, we should be pleased. So I think the, 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 the phase of actually uh, undermining and possibly destroying international uh, institutions uh, and, um, and, and, and the Western community is over, and that's already a good thing. Um, uh, and the first signals from the new administrations uh, are on the whole, whole good with some caveats. I, I'm pleased that the NSC has uh, produced a, a paper which is being analyzed in the EU and compared with a similar strategic EU paper and um, I bet you they will uh, coincide to a large extent. Uh, we've suspended the silly WTO process over um, uh, and, and sanctions over Airbus and, um, and Boeing. We are now spending trillions of euros and, and dollars. And so a dispute from, from 15 years ago over relatively trivial amounts of money um, should be got rid of. Uh, and we have the Biden administration's plans both for domestic um, investment and for um, collaboration uh, with the EU, not just on the China file, but also on things like uh, reforming the global taxation regime which I think is a really welcome um, development. And today uh, we'll have uh, the, um, uh, the climate summit. Uh, the speeches to the Munich Security Conference and to the, um, uh, to the European Council were well received. So I think the ground is laid uh, for a, um, a return not so much to business as usual, but to mainstream American politics of, uh, of, of, of nurturing alliances and building some new ones. Um, I think the Biden administration agrees with the predecessor on China that it's a problem. It will try to deal with it by different methods, um, more multilaterally, more by constructing a uh, an alliance of democracies uh, rather than just unilaterally. And I think here they can count on support. Um, I've been the author of the EPP uh, uh, strategy on China, which has now been unanimously agreed for the first time. Um, and, uh, and, and what we say um, chimes in with what Tony Blinken is saying. We say uh, collaborate where possible, compete where needed, and confront where necessary. Uh, of course, we don't have military assets out in the Far East, and we're not allies of those fellow democracies, the US is, so th that'll be a difference there. 
Uh, but I think our challenge is to uh, maintain trade with China while at the same time maintaining our alliance with the United States. It will not be easy. Um, Europe can play a, 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 a good ally and a, and a moderator of, of the Sino-American um, rivalry at the same time. Where I um, have uh, some doubts is on uh, two decisions. Well, one a decision, one an intuition. The decision to withdraw completely from Afghanistan is risky. I mean, the United States is militarily pre present in over a hundred countries. Would it be really so difficult to keep two and a half thousand troops, maybe even less, but maintaining one base, say Bagram, with some predators uh, as a symbol of American presence in Afghanistan in support of the, of, 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 of the civilized government in Kabul and as a, uh, an insurance policy against the resurgent Taliban and some, the possibility of some terrorists uh, regaining a foothold there. Uh, I wonder. And the other worry that I have is that this administration seems to be going wobbly on US sanctions on Nord Stream. That this administration wants to have a reset with Germany, which is a good thing. Um, but when having to decide whether to favor uh, Central Europe and Eastern Europe, Ukraine or Germany on this, I see at least indecision at the moment. And as you know, the thing about sanctions is, is not good enough to impose them once. You have to follow them because um, different companies get contracts and you have to sanction. Sanctions have to be a, a, a moving show to be effective. And I wonder if they are determined to do that. I hope they do because the sense of betrayal here in Central Europe will be profound if it doesn't happen. Um, and lastly, let me just say that I think Biden will um, uh, make his uh, China coalition a, an alliance of democracies. NATO into a, a, will be promoted more strongly as an alliance of democracies. And that will make Hungary, Turkey, and Poland uh, more uncomfortable. And if I were to advise the, the Polish government, I would say, well, you need to address your rule of law problems because quite soon you will only, not only be on the wrong side of the EU, but also you might find yourself on the offside with the United States. And that's, uh, for a country like Poland, not a comfortable place to be in. Um, so Poland has a particular problem, namely it willfully identified itself as a, as a, as a Trumpist island in Europe, and I'm afraid we, we will now pay the consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now that uh, you mentioned this, uh, this particular aspect, uh, and I'm turning to Katalin Cech uh, from Hungary, of course, I'm sure uh, she will also tell us how Hungary is dealing for quite a longer, a much longer time with being, uh, you know, uh, avoided by US administration on the direct, uh, on, the, on basically being directly um, uh, invited um, or visiting either Hungary or being uh, being in direct touch with the administration, which of course relates to the Polish question. But more broadly speaking, um, how do you see from the point of view of also sitting you know, in the European Parliament and the European Union overall, uh, all these questions uh, from, from, the, from the question of, of state of democracy to these more particular questions, and perhaps you will want to touch uh, anything of, of, the, of the other elements that also relate to, uh, to you know, new taxation on big tech, uh, which is now being discussed and uh, I guess open on the table, uh, but also you being a doctor yourself, a medical doctor, um, uh, anything related to COVID policies and, uh, and response to that. Katalin, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Wojtek. And first of all, many thanks for uh, inviting me at this event. Uh, 
I, I, I do believe it's extremely useful to have this conversation, even though in virtual form, everything is a bit less uh, fun than in person. I hope we can get to, to, to this quite soon. But uh, yes, I think if I want to start with a broad picture, I believe that the last four years really taught the word that what happens when the US is not there. Uh, when we have a US that follows this uh, isolationist, individualistic path, uh, when uh, the global democratic order does not have a strong ally in the uh, form of a, a US president that treats their partners rather as his fiefdom compared to, to equals. Uh, what happens when the multilateral order is being rolled back? And uh, at this point, of course, we are at a new beginning. But we Europeans, we really also have to learn from, from what happened and draw some co co uh, conclusions to ourselves as well. It's, I very much welcome this new opportunity uh, the Biden administration gives to a strengthened and uh, rebuilt EU-US relationship. However, I do believe that this relationship has to be also based on, on equality. And uh, the EU, I think, has learned uh, over the course of the last years that we cannot rely solely on the US uh, at so many issues, starting with defense. Uh, the, I, I suppose when NATO was, uh, was challenged by uh, President Trump, we Europeans uh, started to take a long hard look at uh, how, uh, how we function in that area. And I think that uh, those uh, voices starting by uh, French President Macron, for instance, who called for a stronger EU uh, in the field of defense uh, has to keep on being loud and vocal. Because even with a strong and uh, internationally um, mm, more open US presidency, the EU has to grow up to certain challenges. Uh, because these challenges are there. Uh, very, uh, and frankly, I believe that uh, they were nurtured by certain actions of President Trump. Uh, if we are talking about uh, this issue from a Visegrad perspective, for instance, uh, Mr. Sikorsky uh, very rightly touched upon this issue at the end of his intervention. Uh, we, don't we, we, not, we don't have one Trumpist island uh, in Europe, but many. And uh, I, I would dare to say so that they are not even Trumpist islands, uh, but populistic autocratic islands. Uh, one is my country, Hungary, but there is this uh, illiberal rollback that's been going on in the EU. And uh, this was certainly empowered by a US president uh, who very openly championed thoughts and ideas that uh, would otherwise be incomprehensible from a global leader to say so. And right now there is uh, this moment of truth coming for my country's leader, certainly. We are in a strategic position and we see that the tensions between uh, the uh, US and Russia, US and China will just continue to rise. And in the transactional word of Trumpist foreign policy, it was perfectly okay for many European leaders such as Viktor Orban to do this limbo between the Eastern autocracies and the Western democracies and acting as a Trojan horse within our alliances, uh, given the, the even the US president did not give uh, too much thought uh, to, to multilateral organizations such as uh, NATO sometimes. But right now, at one point, they have to choose sides. And it's extremely worrying to witness uh, how much many countries in our region have, have lost or compromised their uh, pro-European Atlanticist identity that I believe should be at the core of our, uh, core of our foreign policy, not only ideologically, uh, because of course I do believe that Hungary and also other regional uh, powers belong to the West, but also because this is a safe place for us to be at. And I'm, I'm quite sure that the challenges uh, that is posed to the entire Western alliance by, for instance, the cajoling of Mr. Orban with uh, Chinese and Russian leaders, uh, be it uh, on uh, the Huawei problem, on the 5G infrastructure, be it on the Budapest Belgrade uh, train state train line that is built by uh, Chinese loans and basically serves as an as an extension of uh, 
the Belt and Road Initiative down to the purest port uh, from the heart of the EU, and, and also the construction of the new Fudan University campus on, uh, in, in Budapest, which, well, many believe that has quite strong national security implications, these won't be unnoticed. And we have to make a reset also in our minds and in our policies, because I think that for our region, this current administration can also be a huge opportunity. Uh, Mr. Biden knows this region well. Mr. Blinken knows this region well. And uh, if we choose to act uh, based upon the, strong, uh, the same principles that Mr. Biden hopes to construct uh, his foreign policy on the principles of the protection of human rights, democracy, anti-corruption, we can be a strong regional ally of a strong US president. And I think this is something also we need to very briefly touch upon. I don't want to talk too much because, well, of course, we need to you know, open the discussion as well. But uh, the fight for human rights globally, the fight against autocracies, the fight against global corruption and uh, against climate change can only happen if the US and the EU work uh, together. We, as the EU, we need to be more assertive in our foreign policy roles. And I think for that is a good start, uh, or that for that a good start is our climate diplomacy. Because we very often do not think much of, of ourselves as Europeans uh, when it comes to our influence on global issues. But on climate, we are certainly front runners. And I very much welcome that uh, many other countries uh, are following our lead. I hope it will be uh, the same when it comes to a more human rights based trade agenda, stronger sanctions on violators, and a stronger multilateral order. Because we, Hungarians, uh, Central Europeans, Europeans, and Americans, I think this is what we ask our leaders to do. Thank you. Thank you, Katalin. Uh, now, uh, turning to uh, Vladimir Bilchik, uh, Vlado, I, I, my question to you immediately, but choose not to answer at this stage, because I'm sure you have prepared also some, some remarks, opening remarks, are what hurdles also do you see in this, um, you know, ahead of the US, uh, EU, uh, for the future of the EU-US relationship? If you try to elaborate on that, uh, along with your um, uh, prepared uh, notes, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Wojciech, and it's uh, always uh, a great pleasure to accept an invitation uh, from uh, Visegrad Insight. Uh, thanks to Magda uh, for putting this together. I think this is an extremely timely discussion. I'm very happy to be uh, here to be joining my colleagues from the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, I've been listening to my colleagues, so maybe I'll just start by reflecting on some of the remarks uh, and, and answering your question. Um, uh, and um, I was intrigued to hear um, uh, especially Radek's remarks on his recent uh, trip in the US uh, and basically the conclusion that uh, uh, the jury is still out there in terms of how the US is going to treat some of the issues, particularly when it comes to uh, the reset of relations uh, with the EU, EU member states, but also engagement in our neighborhood, including, of course, some of the key issues pertaining to uh, how we deal with Russia. Uh, and, and here is the underlying question, you know, uh, business uh, and and uh, and geopolitics business and values business and uh, political and security issues um, and uh, in this sense I think uh, the bigger challenge uh, or the bigger ball we need to kind of uh, tackle here is the unity of the European Union itself yesterday we had a, a, a very good uh, conference in the EPP uh, group on uh, uh, the future of Europe conference which is going to be launched uh, uh, later in May uh, and I think uh, this uh, Future of Europe conference um, should not really get in stuck in institutional issues. Of course, institutional issues are crucial in the end and we need to look at them in terms of how it can improve the workings of the European Union. But we need to look at the political and policymaking uh, question in terms of what Europe can do better together. And, and of course, there is one area of, of health, for instance, which was suggested by Chancellor Merkel, who joined us in the conference yesterday. Uh, but I, I also think uh, we have a huge challenge when it comes to external relations, when it comes to uh, really showing that we can still uh, make a stance and be a, a real power internationally. We've been on the losing end of this, uh, given the situation in our neighborhood, which, by the way, has enlarged in recent years, thanks to Brexit. Uh, we now have neighbors all around. 
and, and none of these neighbors uh, may be particularly uh, friendly uh, at different times. So uh, this is a, a huge challenge. And I think here, if we want to work well together with, with the United States, we need to be very clear on what is uh, the European policy. And here I'd like to also echo what Radek said. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, he co-authored, or he authored an, an, an excellent paper on, on China as a starting point for our discussion in terms of how we deal with China, which is no longer just an economic partner and power, but is a huge political and geopolitical and security uh, challenge. Um, so uh, when you ask me where I see uh, uh, the, uh, the big problem, I think it's uh, whether we in Europe can actually formulate um, uh, clear enough positions on a number of issues uh, which bind us with the United States, where it can be stronger, together internationally, because there is a lot more that binds us, that divide us, divides us. That's, that's always been clear. We just couldn't work very well with uh, the Trump administration. We have much better opportunities with the Biden, uh, with the Biden administration. Um, and here, uh, uh, let, me, let me just say where I see uh, the, the opportunities and where I see uh, really also uh, the importance of having a strong common voice in the European Union. One concerns our neighborhoods. Um, and uh, uh, in the European Parliament, uh, I'm especially engaged in the Western Balkans um, as a rapporteur for Serbia and uh, uh, chairing uh, the delegation for Montenegro. Um, and uh, when I look at the neighborhood, particularly uh, at the Western Balkans, um, you know, we are facing um, a a hybrid warfare when it comes to daily events, daily politics. Uh, it's not just the issues in Ukraine, in Belarus, uh, the East is extremely important, but also the Western Balkans. Uh, and, and I think this is where uh, with the US, uh, we can make a difference. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and also in terms of the US Visegrad for cooperation, uh, we can try to make a difference. Um, uh, we've promised the Western Balkans the European perspective. Um, it's been a standstill. Uh, things are not moving. Uh, there are uh, reasons uh, which have to do with the region, but there are also reasons which have to do with the fact that we in the European Union have uh, just really not taken the opportunity to be uh, a lot more geopolitical, uh, a lot more uh, forthcoming and a lot braver when it comes to enlargement and the European perspective. We need to do this. Otherwise, we will be taking each day a step back away from more China, more Russia in our backyard. Uh, and this is our backyard. This is our European uh, um, uh, territory, uh, which I think should be a part of the European Union. We are investing heavily in it economically, financially, and we should be as well politically. Uh, and so I think uh, we can really, uh, with the US, work a lot better when it comes to the Pristina, Belgrade or Belgrade Pristina dialogue, when it comes also uh, uh, to, to making a real push for uh, uh, reforms in the region and support for the European forces in the region uh, across the Western Balkans. We need at least one or two good stories from the Western Balkans. We're not getting them. Uh, you know, we are now discussing uh, what is uh, the European future of Montenegro, which has been the front runner and which has a new government and, and of course, um, is, is under all the pressure from China, Russia. And, and other external forces. Um, so that's one region to focus on as well. I wanted to bring that in, in the debate. Uh, and, uh, and I think we can also uh, make a difference when it comes to facing Russia. And, and I think we should, we should really be uh, really clear on this. Uh, next week, we'll have a debate in European Parliament on Russia uh, because of Ukraine, because of Navalny, but also because of what's happening in the Czech Republic. And I think we need to stand by our Czech friends and, and we need to be a really, really clear uh, that uh, what we've, uh, we've learned about uh, the um, uh, in explosion of the uh, arms depot in Vrbetice is, is, is an attack by Russia, Russia's secret services, on the territory of a NATO and an EU member state. And uh, we should really uh, show full solidarity, stand by the Czechs, and, and be consequential in this. Um, and uh, this should be also our guiding principle when we discuss how to uh, deal with Russia in coming weeks and months, how to deal with Nord Stream. And yes, we have a lot of convincing to do also with respect to our German friends and partners. Uh, I know that Germany is very divided on this issue, uh, but I think we can still win this uh, uh, jury and, and uh, have, have also perhaps uh, a, uh, a uh, good uh, tipping balance when it comes to U.S. approach uh, on Austrian and uh, the Eastern Europe. And one last point which I'd like to bring to the debate, uh, because we've already touched on China uh, and, and some of the global issues such as climate, um, I also think where we can make uh, a difference with the U.S. and we need to cooperate a lot more 
uh, and this has to do with the essence of democracy and representative democracy, uh, is uh, uh, the uh, online digital space. Um, this has been a huge challenge when it comes to the workings of public debate, democracy. Um, it's been captured by manipulative disinformation, which has also been spread from Russia and China, but also within the European Union, and which consistently undermines public discourse at our democratic institutions, uh, makes people uncertain about uh, also how to face COVID, uh, 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 undermines the, the vaccination efforts. Um, and we can only do this if we have uh, strong European rules when it comes to uh, the digital online space. Uh, we have a chance to do this with the Digital Services Act. But if we are to be globally strong on this, uh, I think we need to work with the US as well. Um, this is not about uh, um, putting limits on the freedom of speech, but this is about uh, really uh, making some clear joint, ideally global rules, uh, which will make the platforms a lot more responsible for the content that they spread and the speed with which they spread the disinformation. Uh, and, and I think this is, again, one area we should explore a lot more with our American friends. And this is also in the interest of Central Europe, of the Visegrad Four, where uh, some of the regimes uh, uh, we have in our region, uh, particularly in Warsaw and Budapest, uh, benefit greatly uh, from the disinformation campaigns, which are also spread among the population online. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, where I would end it uh, as, as a kickoff, and I very much look forward to having an exchange and your questions. Yeah, thank you. And this is uh, exactly where we will already begin our, let's open up for a Q&A uh, Q session uh, with questions and comments that can pop up in the chat box. I already see some comments with hot news, Slovakia expelling three Russian diplomats, as we are discussing. And uh, you can also raise your hand and, and ask questions. I see already Matthew Breiser, where I will definitely ask uh, Matthew as the first one then, uh, just uh, uh, hinting at the direction that I hope we will also discuss uh, a very pressing issue, a uh, situation in Ukraine on the borders of Ukraine where Russia is mounting up the presence that uh, enables it to conduct military operation in Ukraine, basically an invasion. And the, and the question of what EU can do in this pressing situation in coordination with US on the, on the question of its immediate security uh, at uh, nearly at its borders. I mean, it's in a neighboring, in a neighboring country. Not the, please do not answer immediately, uh, but um, I'll give the floor now to, to Matthew uh, Breiser and uh, I'll uh, uh, see others lining up and I'll give, give you the floor to speak. Uh, Matthew, the floor is yours, and I'll uh, ask then um, uh, MEPs, our guests, to, guest speakers to answer. Yeah, thanks, Wojciech, and thanks so much for organizing this fantastic, fascinating discussion. Uh, and I, I, I guess I'm going to direct my question to uh, Minister uh, Sikorsky, who has had as a, uh, his own adventures in Afghanistan, as I, again, as a Deputy Minister of Defense way back when. But I... I, I, I Building off of actually what, what Katalin Czech was saying about how you know, across Europe now, there's, there's a question about the reliability of the United States now after the Trump experience in a strategic sense. And so how much merit or how much import do you place in what you raised, Dirotic, in the beginning as one of your worries, the U.S. full pullout of Afghanistan? I mean, when you were in Washington, did, did that feel like it's indicative of like a continued isolationist trend or strategic drift? in Washington? Or is the strategic and uh, systematic thinking we all know in Joe Biden with NATO at the center and being you know, tough on deterring Russia, uh, is, is that more prevalent in Washington? Or, or is it too early to tell? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sikorsky. Well, I think um, President Biden will be the first uh, US president since the fall of communism who is not trying to do a reset with Russia. All the others tried. We even had a, a, a doctrine of the Polish foreign policy um, that every US administration learns Russia afresh. <laughs> totally. Uh, and, and here, I, I think it's interesting. I think Putin misplayed his cards so badly that um, the Democrats are now tougher on Russia than Republicans. For for self-preservation reasons, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think uh, President Putin will pay a price here. Um, 
on reliability, you know, I'm not worried about America's friendship for Central Europe. I'm worried about its ability to help us, given the, 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 the scale of the China challenge on which Democrats and Republicans agree. This will consume all the bandwidth and uh, much of the resources. I, I think you can already see that uh, Middle East is being downgraded and one wonders uh, what happens to us. I mean, the Russians have just announced that the um, exercise um, around uh, Ukraine's borders is over. Good. But did we hear any practical steps that the United States was willing to make to help Ukraine? Well, I, what I was saying to my uh, interlocutors in Washington is don't waste this crisis. If Putin is threatening Ukraine, that's a very good reason to help Ukraine. I mean, I wonder if Trump knew about the delivery of the 50 Javelin uh, launchers to Ukraine. Um, but um, you can't defend a country with 50, launch, 50 launchers when uh, Russia has 13,000 13, tanks, right? So, um, uh, so there is uncertainty. Um, I think the match here in the Far East would be over Taiwan. Um, both Ukraine and Taiwan are exposed to, to America's um, geopolitical rivals. Neither of them is a formal ally. Uh, each is at the end of almost impossible logistical lines. And each has to wonder whether the US would go to war for them. But, you know, these are dilemmas that um, that probably uh, are difficult to solve. The one thing that, uh, that, that would be seen as reassurance would be to stop Nord Stream. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe there is a middle solution here uh, uh, for the US. If the US can, can, um, um, can block it till September, then, and if the Greens join the German coalition, the problem may solve itself. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I see a number of comments, uh, which I will choose now to, to read, just, just that you have uh, a chance to relate to them. Uh, Iji and even earlier, uh, Iji Schneider and even uh, earlier Radu Albu Kamanescu pointed to, well, three hours ago we learned that, or, or a little bit earlier, we learned that Russia is actually withdrawing, ordered withdrawal of the uh, troops, uh, definitely something everybody was waiting uh, to, to, to happen. And now the question is from Ishi Schneider, uh, what will Kremlin ask as for a gesture of a de-escalation or what, what will it get? Uh, perhaps something to consider uh, in this debate. Um, uh, Vlado, maybe you jump in here. Maybe I can ask you uh, for this question and I'll relate the other question that is there also in China to, to Catalin in a moment. Uh, thank you very much. I, I also uh, just caught the news as we were speaking that uh, my country, Slovakia, uh, is expelling uh, three, uh, three Russian uh, diplomats uh, from uh, Bratislava. They have seven days to leave. Um, I think that is a very good and a very important gesture. Um, I think our Czech friends need this short of uh, show of solidarity uh, at the moment when they basically have uh, no longer an embassy in Moscow. Uh, and uh, I would hope that other member states uh, actually follow suit. I do remember when we had the Skripal case, uh, in the case of the UK, uh, uh, there was a, a broad reaction uh, across uh, a number of uh, EU and NATO uh, member states. Uh, and uh, um, I uh, do believe that we need to act consequently in this case as well. So I just wanted to uh, put that in. Um, uh, because uh, we have a number of uh, conflictual friends with Russia, 
And what's happened in Ukraine is part of a pattern we've been watching ever since perhaps uh, uh, the resurgence uh, in, in the war in, uh, in Georgia, over Georgia, uh, back in 2008. Uh, you know, this is, this is part of a pattern, part of a trend. And when you're asking me, Wojciech, that question about uh, what uh, Russia is going to ask or we should do um, as, as a sign of uh, perhaps uh, goodwill uh, following the retreat, uh, well, uh, I, I don't really get the question because, I mean, Russia created this tension in the first place. Um, so, you know, we are just, uh, um, if, if, if this means that we shouldn't expect any uh, immediate attack uh, um, when it comes to Ukraine, I mean, that's, that's good news. But I don't think Russia, quite frankly, should be expecting anything uh, uh, because um, this is, this is uh, not the game we should be playing. Um, uh, I, I, I do believe uh, things have come to the point uh, where um, clearly the regime in Moscow is uh, showing that there are very few limits it's willing to consider in its actions. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, we do need to take Russia very, very seriously, uh, obviously as an extremely important partner, but most of all at the moment, it is, uh, it is an adversary. And, and we need to confront it as such at the level also of, of, of European politics. We cannot pretend to be doing business as usual. I agree with Radek uh, Sikorsky, uh, North Stream uh, 2 is, 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 um, is one thing if, if we stopped it, uh, that would certainly send a strong message because uh, politics, uh, finances and economy is it's, it's one business when it comes to Russia very much concentrated in the hands of, of the very few uh, who are um, on top of the power game uh, in Moscow. Um, and, and I think uh, this is uh, what uh, we need to have in mind. You cannot really separate um, the business uh, that you do with Russia from um, uh, the politics. So uh, that would be my remark. And I, uh, you know, I don't really uh, think that uh, uh, there should be some sort of a uh, uh, weakening uh, or, or any, any forthcoming gesture at the moment from uh, the EU side because Russia has created this tension in the first place, however much it's wanted to put out a very different narrative about um, the potential conflict in Ukraine, placing the blame on Ukraine itself. Uh, already, this is the story we've been hearing in the Russian media for some weeks now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't find better words to say that. Uh, thanks, uh, Vlado, for, for that. And, uh, and yes, uh, I think uh, Iji must, must be satisfied with this answer too. Also, you know, from the perspective of Czechia now missing at our table, if, if only we had Czechs, that would be a V for debate. Um, truly, that would be that would be even more uh, things to say on what uh, what Russia needs to do, right? Um, rather than uh, what what need what we need to do uh, to give to to Russia. Now, Catalin, uh, turning to you on the question by I hope this is Joseph Quinn's uh, indeed asking this question in the chat box, um, uh, asking on the divisions within the European Union as a bloc, not only in the region. Uh, but also particularly in the region on, on the question of China and how that uh, is building the dynamics on the US-EU relationship. If uh, I may uh, just, just uh, highlight here, uh, you know, you remember, of course, uh, the, the, the Three Seas initiative that was immediately, uh, that was uh, initiated uh, in the presence of uh, Donald Trump and then it was, of course, uh, uh, I would say even hijacked by, by um, by the opponents of the European integration uh, within uh, you know, particular countries of, of Central Europe. But uh, wouldn't it make sense to use all possible means, including such platforms, which were designed to oppose Chinese interests in the region, to put them on the agenda of Europe and make them European Union uh, uh, platforms in order to advance further and to combine uh, strategic interests with, uh, with US somehow? What do you think? Well, I... First of all, I agree uh, with what you said. I think uh, we, we we should definitely uh, use these platforms and look into other avenues uh, where we can uh, improve these kind of policies. Uh, but on on in the general question uh, that was not posed by Joseph Quinn, if I see it in the chat, it was somebody else uh, who is not Joseph Quinn. Mm, so I I I think. The question itself, uh, what, what is written in the chat, uh, has, has three parts, I think. Uh, it's about the public attitudes uh, 
on China, on Russia, and on the US. And uh, the original question was asked in the context of Hungary. So let me just start by that, and I will link to other points. So first of all, um, I uh, looked up past numbers. And uh, unfortunately, this change in the approval of the US is very clearly linked to the presidency of Mr. Trump. Uh, before that, during the Obama era, uh, these numbers uh, regarding the favorability of the US as a strategic partner were much higher. Also, the approval rating of Mr. Obama was much higher uh, compared to what uh, Mr. Trump uh, managed to deliver. So I, first of all, I would think that a change of leadership, a different kind of policy making, a less erratic behavior uh, from the US president and a more openness from, for uh, issues that matter to our region will certainly help. Stability, reliability, and well, less Twitter antics. Uh, this, this, this probably helps. Uh, but I, so I, I wouldn't tie this issue very directly to, to, uh, to China or Russia as it uh, stands. Um, I think China in general had quite a successful uh, move in our region with certain parts of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Because if you ask a, an average Hungarian person that what uh, comes to their mind when you think China, they will probably say something about cheap small stores that are open until long and uh, we sell like, you know, good products and maybe, you know, Chinese food. So uh, right now in the discourse, unfortunately, we just still don't talk about uh, the geopolitical challenge, the human rights issues as much to penetrate uh, the, uh, the general discourse and where the average citizen would be reminded that a partnership with China is not only about, you know, uh, being able to buy cheaper clothes, but actually on the fact that these clothes were uh, produced uh, by the stain of the blood of uh, laborers in, uh, in the Xinjiang region that they would probably you know, not be so eager to wear uh, if uh, they would know about it. So I think awareness raising and a clearer confrontation on both geopolitical and, uh, and also human rights grounds uh, with China from the EU and also from national leaders will certainly need to happen. Russia is, I think, a bit diff different. I think Russia's approval in our region is mixed at least due to historic ties but uh how to bring the public on both sides for a paradigm shift towards china i think awareness raising for sure but also smart policy making uh, we are recently uh adopted parts of a due diligence uh, framework which will also be expanded in the future and i i think that uh we have to be very very vocal on how we protect our strategic infrastructures from an unreliable partner. And why do we do that? Why is it important? Uh, why is, for instance, 5G is not only a matter of, you know, who is the cheapest, but also a part of who is the safest. We also have to ask this question publicly that uh, if Ericsson can build a 5G system in Vietnam, then probably Ericsson will be capable of building a 5G system in Europe as well. Uh, so supposing so these questions very clearly for the public so that they know about the dilemma and also be much more uh, forthcoming with, with, uh, with the sanction, sanctions framework that we can use and explain to the public that why do we do that. And let me just say that uh, for this, the unanimity uh, that still has to be upheld is clearly not helping. Uh, recently, the uh, Hungarian side vetoed, uh, for instance, the statement on uh, mm, on the new Hong Kong uh, legislation, probably linked to certain close ties to, to China. So we have to be stronger, but also we have to be more clear towards the public that why do we do that? And, uh, and, and this is probably something that will be able to change people's minds because let's face it, the real challenge is not, not really uh, about perceptions. But it's, it's, it's rather whether we want to be on the side of the autocracies uh, or in democracies. Do we want to uh, partner with our transatlantic allies or venture into more difficult waters uh, at our strategic uh, areas as well with partners that we should not necessarily rely on? And this has to be translated in a way that the, the public also finds it um, 
find, finds it close to, to their lives, but this link has to be made and this was not made yet, I think. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your answer here. Now, I, we might have time for just one or maximum two, que uh, two questions. Uh, Ricardo, Sil Ricardo Silvestre um, uh, signaling, he, he's asking a question now. So from across uh, the continent, Portugal, right? Uh, Ricardo. Thank you, Wojciech. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank you for taking the question. I'm going to piggyback on what Vladimir was saying. And I'm very interested about this 100 days of Biden-Harris administration because we did saw during the Trump administration a push regarding digital, uh, the digital realm. Like for example, we saw antitrust laws by the uh, Attorney General Bill Barr. We saw uh, senators from the Republican side asking for the end of liability uh, shield. Uh, for example, there's this is still ongoing. Um, process on the courts regarding the Attorney General of New York trying to regulate uh, digital platforms regarding speech and regarding uh, threats to democracy. So in your opinion, in the three of you, do you see this scaling back a little bit in the United States and maybe Europe can take a little bit of the, the lead in here? Or do you think that this pressure will continue to grow? Thank you. Uh, excellent. And before I uh, give you the, uh, all of you, I will ask you to, to relate to the digital questions at hand, also including the taxation, the pot potential taxation of the, of the big companies, tech companies, which I think is a, a gesture of uh, towards Europe, but of course it is also dictated by internal uh, American politics and demands, you know, the, the plans of the US administration. Let me just refer to, to additional questions that we may not be able to um, to answer, but still, um, there is uh, Michal Korakowski asking on Biden administration continuation of Trump administration initiatives to um, oper uh, operationalize DFC uh, to a tool to balance China's influence in, in, in finance. And there is also a question from Ray Vucic, uh, who is not uh, Joseph Quinn. Um, he's questioning about the US military. Um, Focused, um, fo focus on China. He writes, um, the US uh, will be more focused on China, but not abandoning Europe, of course, uh, not adding large numbers uh, or of, of troops or amounts of capabilities either. How does Europe strengthen its defense pillar? How does it, you know, builds up uh, its own response to the security threats? I couldn't imagine uh, a better person to uh, uh, to begin now than than, than Vlado. I'll let you, uh, Mr. Sikorsky, to conclude the whole panel discussion. Then addressing all also all of this, uh, Vlado, uh, you've been also uh, touching base on on some of these questions in your uh, career. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, um, uh, for the sake of uh, brevity and, and, and clarity, I'll stick uh, just to the digital question because that was uh, directed right at me. Uh, look, um, uh, I, I do believe that uh, one of uh, the key issues for this European Parliament, for this European Commission, is to uh, really agree on rules uh, when it comes to uh, the digital giants, the uh, online platforms. Uh, we have uh, important political uh, and legislative proposals in the pipeline in the European Union, uh, softer ones such as European Democracy Action Plan and harder ones such as uh, Digital Services Act and Digital Market Act. Uh, these are already heavily discussed. We've actually had a very good conversation on these issues also with some of our colleagues across the Atlantic. Uh, and I'm convinced um, that uh, we cannot uh, have uh, uh, um, legislation on the social uh, platforms um, around, build around a single, even a larger member state in Europe. We need to have a joint European approach. That's also going to be to a benefit of uh, us in Central Europe, particularly the smaller, but also medium-sized countries. Uh, I think this is uh, absolutely necessary. And I do believe as Europe agrees on these rules, uh, these rules uh, could become uh, a, um, um, a real a platform for discussing uh, some of the global uh, rules which uh, we have when it comes to dealing with digital space. I mean, digital revolution has been one of the biggest changes we faced and it's brought some very 
very positive consequences in terms of the exchange of information, but it's also uh, uh, brought some detrimental consequences, let's face it, uh, for uh, the way our politics is organized. I mean, we saw it uh, live uh, in the US, what happened in the Capitol. Um, and this was no coincidence. Of course, it's all ignited also by uh, the way the politicians use and misuse uh, the social, social platforms. Uh, but I think this is why we need rules. And I think we can get decent, good European rules, which will protect, on the one hand, free speech, freedom of opinion, on the other hand, uh, uh, really uh, uh, um, uh, control the spread, massive spread of manipulative disinformation. And this is something that we should address also jointly with the US uh, when we look at some of the issues we are facing. If we are serious about protecting representative democracy um, on our two continents um, and also in the wider world, I think we need to also have a frank and honest uh, and joint approach to the digital uh, tools, which are now so dominant when it comes to uh, democracy and democratic discourse. I'm absolutely convinced here. So I think Europe can be a rule setter. And I think Europe can, uh, can also work together with the US uh, on uh, how uh, to make these uh, roles work globally. Uh, this is certainly one of, uh, one of our key priorities also in the European Parliament. We have a special committee, by the way, which is devoted to uh, foreign interference in our democracies and also this information. So follow our work. Uh, I happen to be the EPP spokesperson on this committee. Uh, so it's also close to my heart. And thanks for the invitation here. It's been a wonderful discussion. I just wish we had more time. Uh, yes, we, we, we should have more time, but since we began three minutes past, uh, there, there's still uh, time exactly for the, for the basically closing remarks and uh, answers to any of the questions that remain. And I would uh, urge uh, uh, you, Mr. Sikorsky, to, to touch base on, on the question of what Europe can do to fill in the, the gap on, on uh, some call it strategic autonomy, maybe that's a vague, uh, vague term, but simply on, on delivering on security in real terms in, um, um, in Europe, in, in the region here. Uh, what do you think, uh, you know, you also in, in the European Parliament uh, can do or are working on uh, in that regard to, to, to be a real partner to, to the US? First of all, let me uh, agree with Vladimir that um, uh, we need to become the global rule setter in uh, cyber, and we can, uh, or put it differently, we are the only ones who have a chance. China is not going to do it, Russia is not going to do it, and the US Congress is captured. And we have the size of the market, and um, we are not captured, and our population is sensitive to privacy issues, and we started doing it. Um, uh, there is regulation on AI, there is the commission paper on digital services, uh, but we need to do far, far more. Uh, and on this, we are, could be a very valuable partner of the US vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Secondly, uh, I think uh, taxing uh, tech, uh, taxing goes beyond tech, of course. Um, companies should pay some tax somewhere. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a pro low tax kind of guy, but, um, but it should not be uh, at the expense of smaller companies that the, 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 the playing field should be more level on this. And I think for the first time we have a joint interest with the US, they also see the seepage away of uh, revenue. And, um, and thirdly, uh, uh, Biden spoke before he became president on sorting out tax havens. It's um, estimated that 50 trillion euros, dollars is hidden away. Imagine what we could do with the money and we need it desperately. If we could tax all of it and perhaps confiscate some of it. And remember, we've never legislated for these things to be created. These things exist thanks to loopholes in, in legislation. We could pass legislation that makes it illegal for our citizens and our companies to use these, 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 these avoidance schemes. We can do this and this would be a, uh, a very good thing. But as, um, as regards autonomy, there are uh, two areas with, without which it will never happen. One is defense and here Europe is not serious. Uh, we've started a defense budget, but, you know, it was supposed to be 13 billion. 
that would be it would have been a good beginning it's been cut to seven you can't do serious defense on one billion per annum for a whole continent you know Poland alone spends uh, 11 billion uh, euros. Um, you know, in, with defense, it's very simple. It's very expensive, therefore follow the money. If they're not committing the money, they're not serious. And the second is also about money. It's to do with the euro becoming a reserve currency and, and being autonomous of the dollar clearing mechanism. And of course we are not. We tried to create a very limited instrument, payment instrument uh, with Iran only to do, I stress, uh, to do with things uh, that are permitted, like pharmaceuticals and food. And even that doesn't work. So I'm afraid it's all just talk that member states are not serious about. Well, that's not optimistic, but the optimistic notes were there that, uh, that there are actually ambitions to legislate some of the things and the loopholes uh, uh, to be closed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, uh, it's merely a beginning of our uh, chat, I believe, and we will have a lot of other discussions on the 100 days of uh, Joe Biden presidency. And, and we definitely should keep in mind many of the statements and remarks um, by uh, Mr. Rade, uh, Radosław Sikorski, uh, uh, Ms. Katalin Czech. Uh, Mr. Vlado Bilcik, who joined us for today's discussion. Thank you all for, for being with us and um, we'll uh, make it all, uh, you know, the recording later available for everyone. I do remind everyone then it's also a privilege of, of using this, uh, these discussions. Uh, you can subscribe. You can subscribe to Visegrad Insight to read more stories on Central European perspective, and you can do that for one euro for uh, two, for two months even uh, with the uh, with the code join the club. Uh, so I invite you now to to do that. Uh, all of you that, that are present, you can also share this code, of course. Thanks. It was lovely to see you all. Uh, really, true pleasure. Great questions. Uh, fantastic discussion. And apologies for any technical uh, questions that we encountered. Uh, special, uh, 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 you know, my apologies to Joseph Quinn, but I think he texted me just in the moment. He was very happy to get such a big fame. You know, uh, we are here also to promote uh, SIPA people. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you.